It's Wednesday, and that means another episode of Unlapped. On today's podcast, we talk Williams announcing a new team principal, the F1 calendar locked in at 23 races for the year, Red Bull coming stateside to launch their car for the new year, and a revised qualification format. All that and more on this week's episode of Unlapped. Needless to say, he did not engage in the game of rock, paper, scissors. You know, growing up in the 90s, Williams was was a powerhouse. The winning car was engulfed in, in flames, um, and it was a bizarre moment in the paddock. For a second, I thought Tyler was asking me how many kilos I needed to lose, and I thought, wow. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it really it caught me out for a second there, dude. I was no, like, wait, no. wait a second. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tyler Denning. I'm the reserve driver, so to speak, for Unlap. Katie George, she's getting some PTO for the week. Joined by Nate Saunders, Lawrence Edmondson. Gentlemen, thank you so much for having me. Hey, Good to have you here, Tyler. On. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I'd like to just do a quick public service announcement before we start. Anyone watching on video, if you see steam next to me, I'm not smoking. My house isn't on fire. I've just made myself a very hot cup of tea uh, in, a, in a, what's quite a cold house. So I just wanted to to throw that out there um but no excited to do the show There's, every week at the moment we seem to get one storyline thrown up don't we so uh same again this time yeah the news cycle very much uh year round in in formula one now lawrence uh any hot tea for you today no it's um i tend to leave caffeine alone from about 4 p.m in the afternoon otherwise i can't sleep but i can confirm that in london at the moment it is very very cold so um yeah i'll uh i'll have to have something a bit later on well, I have my water bottle. I'll stay hydrated as well. We have a lot to get into today. Back every Wednesday, as you mentioned, Nate, throughout the year. So stay glued uh, to the socials. And we have a studio show that will be coming for this 2023 season. More to be announced here within the ESPN family of networks. Remember as well, if you're watching on YouTube, like the video, leave a comment, jump into the conversation. Don't forget to subscribe to ESPN for more on F1 and our F1 podcast. And if you're listening, Give us a five-star review if you like what you hear. Let's dive in. So we start out on a somber note for the week. Jenny Gao, a colleague of ours, works for the BBC, had announced via social media that she suffered a stroke. So the paddock, the hearts of everybody within F1, thoughts go out with her as she goes through her recovery process. Yeah, really sad news. And we used to work with Jenny closely at ESPN. You know, we've always seen her around. Um, you know, I think she, I mean, she's been there since, bef you know, before I started. So one of those people that's always been very helpful, just really friendly, really accommodating to everything. So yeah, you're know, rooting for you, Jenny. You know, hopefully see you again soon. Uh, back up and well in the paddock. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, Jenny, as Nate said, was a great colleague of ours. Uh, we did, I can't remember how many different videos and stuff like that. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, many, yeah. And, and she really, as, as long as I've been working in the paddock, she's been there. So, Really looking forward to her making a recovery and uh, and getting back in the paddock as soon as she can. Our best wishes go out to her and throughout the recovery process, hope to see her back in the paddock very soon. Start with first news item in 23 races. So, gentlemen, we know the calendar finally. It's been floating. Where would we be? We knew for a long time China wouldn't be there. Portugal was floated. But we have 23 races. It will be a record amount. But I really think the big story in this one is we have a very big gap along with a lot of travel again this year. We do. And it's an unusual gap. We used to one in August. Like that's planned. F1 does that so that people can go away and spend time with their families. But this is pretty much all of April. I think we've got the Australian Grand Prix on the 2nd of April. And then 28 days later, uh, there's the Azerbaijan Grand Prix on the 30th of April. So about a four week gap. And then F1 goes into having five races in six weeks. So quite clearly, this wasn't how Formula One planned it. But we did have some doubts about China for a long time and whether that race could go ahead, given the COVID situation in there, given the lockdown situation, which they had last year and was really the reason that F1 said it would cancel the race. Uh, now, of course, a lot of those restrictions have lifted in China, but um, the uh, rate of COVID cases has gone up dramatically. I was reading about it today and um, it's, it's pretty scary. So F1 obviously felt like it couldn't go go back there. I think it's lost a little bit of interest in China as well over recent years. Um, and there was talk about Portugal coming in and replacing it. But F1 said from the very start that, look, if it doesn't make sense to add a 24th race, they weren't just going to do it for the sake of it. So when they say that, does it make sense? I guess they mean, does it make financial sense? It's a lot of, um, you know, it's a lot of effort to move Formula 1 around the world anyway, and to add in another race and perhaps not get the money back from it. 
you know, that they needed to uh, to cover the costs uh, w- was possibly a concern. That, and we also talked on the last podcast when we were speculating about this, that Portugal has a World Endurance Championship race that same weekend at the Portimao Circuit. So there was always going to be a bit of a bit of an issue there trying to organise that. So clearly, F1 looked at all the options and decided that 23 races was enough. I quite like this kind of unenforced, or sorry, unintended early break that we have. I was thinking about this late last year when we had the 24 race calendar confirmed as Lawrence said we've always been used to the August break and it's you know it's one of the things that kind of I keep think it keeps people sane during that kind of run in June and July you know when it the races are coming thick and fast but given how many races there are now I've always thought that maybe you almost put those you you split that one break into two different breaks same length one before the European season starts and one after you know, you have the flyaways at the start of the year, flyaways at the end. And it might be, you know, you often see it in Formula One, you know, teams actually come out of a break like that and say, we actually quite liked that. You know, it, it was quite good for us. Might be something they incorporate going forward. Who knows? They do seem keen to keep 24 going forward, but um, that seems to be something I can imagine the calendar kind of going that way. Um, but yeah, it's a shame as well, because I, I quite enjoyed Portugal. You know, I remember the races we had there. It was it was pretty good. So yeah, a shame. But then a weekend off is always, always pretty fun as well. So you know, swings around yeah. about. I think you look at it from the fans' perspective, though, it's it's a tricky one because you're going to have three races, and let's say we have three brilliant races, and then, oh, wait. Yeah, a minute. huge gap. When, when's your next? It's a bit like Formula E's had that problem, I think, often with their calendar and planning it, and sometimes it can lose momentum, especially, and for me, it's just that it's so clogged during, you know, the calendar, the schedule is so clogged during the mid, middle part of the year. The spacing, you know, in an ideal world would be better. But um, the problem is, is that once F1 put out the initial calendar that had, say, Baku and Miami back to back, which I think I'm going to be attending both of those races. That's the plan at the moment. And I don't know exactly how I'm going to get from uh, Azerbaijan to Miami in uh, in the space of three days. But it's going to be pretty painful because uh, there's no direct flights from London to Baku for starters. And then everyone's got to try and try and get back across. The, the, the drivers have it a bit easier, I think. You know, the drivers have private jets. The team principals have private jets. But there's lots of people, um, you know, and they will tell you as well, you know, who a, a lot of mechanics, engineers who all have to fly um on commercial flights and um yeah it's going to be pretty hard work okay there will be a break before but then just to put yourself into a azerbaijan miami back-to-back seems seems crazy but lawrence you you can't call in any favors and hop on any of the drivers (laughs) private jets there's an idea maybe i'll write some nice things about drivers i was gonna say our (laughs) our output's gonna be very positive about max and and the guys that have private (laughs) private airways for the next few months Um, (laughs) i i think they like like to leave a racetrack and not see any journalists. So I think that's very, very unlikely, but you never know. There's a time to call in the favor. This is it. Yeah, you know, where my mind went to it was you have four races across those first two months. There's those three empty weekends. So you start Bahrain, that's on March 5th. Then we go to Saudi. Then we go to Australia. Then from there, Azerbaijan, Miami, and Imola. So within those three empty weekends, I just think competitively, when you talk about car development as well, is this going to benefit teams? early on in the season? I think any team that's having problems or um, needs a bit of time to go back to the wind tunnel and and, and calibrate their findings, it will be very useful um, because uh, the reality is that the constant grind of races and also sometimes uh, if you have accidents, the use of parts um, that early in the season can be quite difficult for teams to juggle. So I guess there is a slight positive there for teams. But then again, if, if you've gone and won the first three races, you probably wouldn't mind having another race, you know, two weeks later, just to try and uh, cement your advantage. So um, it could work either way, but it's uh, certainly it will be factored in. And a lot of the plans that teams would have had in place, well, I suspect they would have been targeting updates for um, around Imola kind of time anyway, maybe, you know, earlier with, with Miami, but I would have thought the big first update would come after, after yeah, well, in Imola. Um, so, uh, they, they will just be kind of recalibrating that, and again, you're know, just making the best use of the precious wind tunnel time they have, the CFD usage they can they can get through, and uh, making sure it all counts on track. But it, it will change it slightly. Do you think that eventually, maybe next year, years to come, that there needs to be a re- reconfiguration? geographically to to minimize some of these travel constraints that we've talked about we've all obviously heard some of these things do you think that it will happen does it need to happen 
I think it does from both a personnel and kind of an optics point of view. You know, if you look at those, both those things together, you know, the personnel is pretty well documented, you know, you, and it's not just these, you know, I always feel sorry for these mechanics, you know, they're always really big guys and they're squeezing onto these, you know, they, they all fly economy. You know, some people have this idea that all, all the guys are flying, you know, business and, you know, it, it, they're flying as you would to your, to your holidays and that, you know, that it wears people down and people spend a lot of time on the road away from their families, you know, that, that could definitely be helped. You know, if you scheduled the, the calendar properly, but also, you know, I mean, there was, there was a, there was a graphic going around, wasn't there a few weeks ago showing a plane going around the world. And obviously it didn't account for the, the breaks. It was just going from one to the next, but it just was at some points. It was like the, the moment that Lawrence mentioned, you know, Baku, Miami, then you've got three races in Europe. It doesn't look like it makes sense. And, you know, when, you know, in the current climate, you know, you want, you want to be pushing forward a positive message, a green message. It's harder to do that when the calendar looks like that. So, yeah, I think it's something F1's going to have to address at some point. Whether how easy that's going to be is is a, a bigger question because a lot of these races that are close together, you know, specifically want to stay away from other races in the same area as them because, you know, they say, well, look, if there's a bit of space between us, it helps us sell tickets. You know, people might choose this race over us. Cota used to say that about Mexico. They don't so much now. Um, but I think some of the newer events maybe you know might start seeing that. Um, but again, it it does encourage races to stand out on their own as well. You know, kind of forge their own identity. So it's not the end of the world if they are together. But um, it's definitely something I know that Formula One have talked about it. You know, behind the scenes, you know, the people putting the calendars together have tried to work out in an ideal world what would it look like. And I think it looks a little bit different to the one we actually have. Um, but of course, you know, it, it's one thing writing it down on a piece of paper or on a word document. And it's another thing actually kind of getting that into practice and and actually executing it. So yeah, I think the two, the ideal calendar in everyone's head and the actual calendar are quite far apart, but it's hard to see them bridging that gap in the near future, maybe, maybe down the line. Lawrence. Yeah, I I, I think Nate's right from an environmental perspective. I mean, everyone's kind of losing a losing a battle there anyway, um, just by the very nature of it. But the biggest CO2 outlay that f1 has you know forget the cars going around um it's it's the travel and um to do it in a smarter way i think could work and also you know i, I think it can help to build interest in those markets you can look at it one way of them kind of taking fans off each other but how about they work together and they put on events and you know there's a chance if you go to one race and the next week you don't have to go that far to watch the next one and you get your f1 fix you know doubled and Perhaps you can sell tickets that way. I don't know. It, it seems to me like there's there's a smarter way to move Formula One around the world than than the one we have right now. But um, it's uh, it's a difficult one also because you have a lot of contracts already in place uh, that say certain races like Abu Dhabi is always the final race of the year. Uh, Bahrain at the moment seems to have a contract which allows it to be the first race of the year. And so those two are obviously fairly close to each other geographically, but they're at opposite ends of the uh, ends of the uh, calendar and then you have things like the weather you know you can't really hold a race in the middle east in the summer because uh it's going to be far too hot to um to go racing so there's a lot of considerations and you know i don't I, it's a very difficult job to to put it all together but there's got to be a smarter way last question on this before we break a little bit of news is 23 the sweet spot is this a number that that you think that we should stay at more or less where do you think we should be I think the sweet spot was a few years ago. Um, I think I like 21. <clears throat> you know, I, I, I sound like a killjoy saying that, but <laughs> I do think, I, I think last year was a great example of the negatives of a long calendar. I think, I really do think 20, 2021, the season um, was a bit of an anomaly, you know, having a race where there's that many, sorry, a championship race with that many events going to the final race. Of the season is actually pretty unlikely. You know, last year there were so many events um and max you know max was fantastic all year and red bull were fantastic but you got to i think the summer break and you're like wow there's still 10 11 races left and max could in theory could win all of them he nearly did and you know that's not new in formula one you know michael schumacher often went into the summer break and you think he could win the remaining races the difference then was that it's, there's only six races left so i think from a competitive point of view sometimes i do worry about that um but yeah we'll see i mean th I, so i think yeah 21 races 20 races that one seems to me to be the limit but it, the number seems to be going up and up so i think my sweet spot and f1 sweet spot are very different Lawrence, yeah i i think uh, f1 is looking at 25 and uh and then seeing whether it can push it further but there does need to be changes within the sport you know i think as nate said earlier you can't have uh 
some of the team personnel traveling as much as they are um, in uh, over a year, it just becomes really difficult. You get burnout. So I think F1 has to look at itself and, and kind of look at what the people can do within it uh, and how you continue to provide entertainment. Because so often, just as Nate kind of said, that you'll get to the middle of the season and you'll be like, oh, well, you know, Max Verstappen can win this race, but it doesn't really mean anything because there's so many races left. It can go either way or, oh, look, you know, Lewis Hamilton's won another race. That's his fifth in a row. This is just going uh, to, to, towards a, a a very obvious conclusion. So, yeah, it's um, it, it's a tough balance. I personally, I I think around 18 is, is very good. If you get 18 of the best racetracks in the world and, and you base it on that, then that's great. But F1 is a business and each of those racetracks pay money and some racetracks, which are not the best in the world, pay more money. So that's why we have them on the calendar, like places like Abu Dhabi, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia. Um, so I, I think uh, that's the balance that F1's got to find over the coming years. But um, I think we are currently at a tipping point where if you go more, you need to find a way to make it possible for the teams to do it. And just to just to jump in, sorry, Tyler, before we move on, spoke to one team boss uh, at the end of last year, and he said something quite interesting about the calendar. He said, you know, obviously teams aren't able to throw loads and loads of money at mechanics, at engineers. That you know, they they try they try their best to pay very competitively. So it's a very difficult sell when you say to somebody with a family, you're going to be on the road 24, 25, 26 weeks of the year, and there's a lot of industries that can probably offer the same wages as a Formula One team, maybe better uh, for certain roles, but also with the with the proviso of where well, you're actually just going to be down the road from your family. So I think that that's started to creep in for teams as well. They've started to realize that the turnover maybe is getting a bit a bit more. You know, it's that's accelerating a bit. And as soon as that happens, I think you have an issue. I totally agree with the, you know, F1 being a business, but you hope they get to a point where they can actually scale back and having less races makes each race a bit more valuable on the calendar. You know, you've got 18 of them and suddenly it's like, well, you've got to pay a premium to be one of the 18. You know, it's, it's all well and good being one of 26 races, one of 27 races, but being one of 18 seems a bit better when you compare them like that. Yeah, I think it's it's that fine line of dilution of your product, competitive balance. You talk about the personnel yeah. as you move throughout the season and does that affect what you're actually seeing on track versus you know the almighty dollar and the money that they want yeah. to make. And you know, maybe That's actually, to a point of, of rotating races as well, where it appears, you yeah. know, you know, every two, three years. But I think, Lawrence, to your point as well, what really intrigues me is you have to incentivize these races to put on a good product, to have mm -hmm. a good race that people want to come to and want to see. So it's going to feel important and you don't expand so much that it dilutes. It's interesting to say dilute as well. That's a really good point, Tyler, because the, the one reason the teams are kind of <laughs> against Andretti is because they're saying, you know, it dilutes the price fund. Yeah. Um, and obviously a it's a different, a it, in, it's a different type of dilution, but you're absolutely <laughs> right. You know, if you look at it from a, a product point of view, um, yeah, I think, I think it's a really good point. So, um, yeah, interesting, yeah, interesting use of the word. I, I just, it just twigged as you said it. I was like, it's quite a funny, funny yeah. contrast. Yeah. Both sides of it. So, well, you talked new races last year, Miami was a new race that was on the calendar, but we have some breaking news that we've heard coming out of Miami that they're trying to improve the experience down there this coming year. That's right. And First off, they're going to resurface the track. Um, people who paid kind of close attention to what was going on at the track. Not everyone, I think, in Miami was. I think a lot of people were very interested in the VIP experience. But if you were watching closely on track, you will notice that the surface was starting to crumble away in certain places. And I think it was it became more of a story than it actually was in the race. And in some ways, uh, it actually made the racing quite exciting because more mistakes were made. But it's really not what you want. It's a random element which um, F1 tries to get out of. So that, that they've moved to working with Tilka, which um, are a very well-known uh, track development company. They've designed a lot of the circuits on F1 and they do a lot with track surfaces. They know what's best for racing. So the organizers at Miami are very convinced that by resurfacing the track, they'll um, avoid any of the embarrassment that might go with the track falling apart and they'll improve the racing. So I, I hope they, uh, they, they, they succeed in that. Um, perhaps more interesting uh, and more exciting is that they're going to move the paddock, so the place where all the teams are based, uh, where they all have their hospitality units, inside the Hard Rock Stadium, on, on the field, where you know you usually see the Miami Dolphins play. And so you'll have everyone kind of walking in between their little huts uh, out on the field, and the fans will be able to watch that. So they'll be able to sit up in the stands, um, watching down and see, say, 
Carlos Sainz go and chat with his good, good buddy Lando Norris in the uh, in the paddock. And I, I, how I imagine it, although it, I can assure you the paddock isn't quite as exciting as this, is that it will be almost like a a kind of real life episode of Drive to Survive going along. So you'll be able to uh, <laughs> with your binoculars follow Gunter Steiner and see who Christian Horn is shouting at and all the rest of it. Um, but yeah, the, the reality is that as Nate and I know, we spend a lot of time in the paddock. Uh, it's not always quite as exciting as it looks on Drive to Survive. <laughs> I think, but people are going to be quite it, bored. It, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, it, I, I think it's a cool thing. You know, when there's nothing going on on the track and people want to see something different. And look. You know, I, I think we get very used to seeing the drivers and the team principals. We're incredibly fortunate with that. But for a lot of people, you know, you'll go to a race and sure, you'll see the car go past, but the driver's wearing a helmet. He's kind of right down inside the car. So at least you might get to see some of your heroes. So um, I think it's a cool development. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's a race that um, I think needed some improvement last year. They, they also looked at the track layout, um, the chicane, especially that, that tricky bit where Carlos Sainz and Esteban Ocon both had big accidents and they considered changing it, but they just felt that it wasn't really possible with the space they had. Uh, they're going to remove some of the curbs that they had there, which led to the nastiness of those accidents. But um, yeah, I, I feel like it's still a race where there can be improvement on the track layout, but the good news is that they are, they're not afraid of making changes. They're not afraid of looking at maybe what went wrong the previous year and, and, and changing it for the next one. So over time, I think hopefully it will develop into a, a really good race. Yeah, hopefully we can see Carlos Sainz with the football helmet on running football routes on the football <laughs> field down there for, for everybody to watch. Nate, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think the, the stadium definitely does sound like a live drive to survive. I think as well, I don't know if anyone played The Sims, but yes, it might look a little, no, might look a little bit Sims. like that. So I don't know if <laughs> some drivers should get some of those green well, yeah, maybe mood, maybe, little, maybe, maybe their leader. moves won't be that good on the Thursday when they're talking to us. Maybe they get one of those red ones to show they're really, really ticked off and really annoyed. Um, but that'd be quite interesting. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I say it will be quite boring. I think it, I think Lawrence is right. It will be very interesting. And actually, one of the cool things about the paddock sometimes is you're doing interviews with any driver. And there's some paddocks where you have balconies and stuff like that. And it's always, I mean, it happens a lot with Lewis and with Fernando. There'll be people up, you know, up on those balconies shouting down at them and just just saying their names over and over again. And for us, we're a bit like, you know, we're just we're trying to ask questions and listening to listen to what they say. But it's great because the, the drivers often just get confused by that. And they're you know, not confused, sorry, distracted by that. And they're looking around and they're kind of talking to us, but they're just enjoying this adulation from above. So it must be very, very yeah just a cool experience for them um i really liked miami last year so i'm glad you know they've obviously looked at a few things and this is kind of this is kind of the new standard for formula one i think it's good that races come in and they realize we have to we have to listen to what the fans say we have to improve things one of the big things is um you know maybe people get their tiny violins out at this point but a lot of influencers and and wealthier fans had a really bad time at miami last year because where the some of the VIP areas, you know, they weren't set out in a brilliant way. You could barely see into the racing. They've stepped all of that up as well. So a lot of um, kind of feedback and improvement uh, on different things, um, and they're keeping the marina in place, as far as I'm aware. Nate, you uh, you missed me playing the the tiny violin. Oh, but, I did. Uh, yeah, sorry, I did miss that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, no, I, I think you know to the the paddock experience. I was in the paddock in Austin, uh, and this teenager, uh, you know, Christian Horner was walking out, and he just happened to pull up right next to me. And this this young kid walked up to him and said, "Hey, you want to play rock paper scissors?" Uh, and Christian Horner looked at him. But you know, I think in the paddock you get some of those more organic experiences uh, where it's not just solely focused on the racing. So if the fans can see some of those things. As well, Horner, but, Horner might be the worst Horner. person. Horner might be the worst person to play <laughs> rock paper or ask to play rock paper scissors. I can imagine the scowl he gave the kid. As yeah, he, uh, yeah he did, needless to say, he did not engage in the game of rock paper scissors. <laughs> I mean, G Gunther would have played. I wonder which other team bosses would. Yeah, have Gunther might have gone best two out of three because that's well, yeah, traditionally you yeah. got to go two out of three. I, I think Christian would have played if Toto had challenged him. <laughs> yeah, 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 there, yeah. That, that <laughs> could have been, been televised. You know, that's that's you know, we need to to get that on. You know, for us, we're unveiling all these new things for the coming season. It's a team principal uh rock, paper, scissors tournament. Lawrence, I think to to your point as well, though, uh it's good that it's not just the improvements for the fan experience, but they're reevaluating, resurfacing the track to make sure that the racing is put at the forefront, that we get quality racing first and foremost. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, like I said, I don't, I don't think the the track surface was a major issue in the end. But um, if if they can get essentially 
a surface that has uniform grip across it, you're always going to have a racing line and that's always going to have more grip over the course of a weekend because the rubber gets laid down there. But the closer you can get to uniform grip across, it means that you can go offline and overtake. And of course, that's the important thing. That's what we want to see. Uh, so um, I think that's what they're aiming for. And in Tilka, look, you know, I mean, a lot of people uh, who are, you know, maybe kind of deeper fans of the sport will know about Herman Tilker and his company and the tracks that he's uh, brought into F1. And for a long time, he wasn't very popular. People said all the tracks are the same, but some of those have turned out to be uh, to be very good. And let's face it, they have the experience. You know, they've been involved in pretty much every new track for the past 20 years or so. So I, I, I feel like if you're going to get somebody who knows their track surfaces and knows what to lay down and, and how to improve the racing, uh, that'll be it. But um, like I said, just a few little tweaks around there, I, I think would be good. Um, because, you know, what, while they did a great job with what they have, because actually before this podcast, we were just talking about the Caesars Palace Grand Prix in Las Vegas <laughs> back in the early 1980s and how that was run in a car park. And with Miami, the big concern going there the first year was this is just the car park of the Hard Rock Stadium. You know, what a par- if it's a, a parking lot for our American a, listeners? <laughs> a, a parking lot. Sorry. Yeah. To, yeah. You use the uh, vocabulary for the American listeners. That's right. A parking lot. And, you know, a lot of uh, criticism is leveled at tracks with big runoff. They're called parking lot Grand Prix, you know, even if they're not, you know, even if they're very well-designed racetracks. So the big concern going there, there was that it was going to be like racing round uh, in circles with, you know, just silly little kind of obvious kind of basic corners, but it wasn't, it, it's not like that, but I still feel like there's, um, you know, there's a little bit of improvement to be made. So, um, but like I said, they're looking at what went wrong the previous year. They're changing it. So uh, that's a good attitude to have. Yeah, that the news for Miami, which will be in its second year, race number four on the calendar. We were just talking team principals playing rock, paper, scissors, but have a new team principal that we can talk about as well. We stand in the middle of January, the season beginning shortly. February 23rd is when testing begins, but James Valls announced as now the team principal for Williams, their third team principal in their history it's been a part of nine constructors across his time at mercedes and going further back in his 21 years in f1 your initial thoughts on on this move for williams i think it's fantastic i think if you look at the people available um james Valls is 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 up there i mean i didn't expect it to happen because i didn't think he would be made available but um if you look at where james is in his career and uh the position he's adopted at Mercedes most people will know him as the chief strategist which is is the role he had for a very very long time uh going as far back as uh the time when that team was owned by Honda when it became Braun GP in 2009 and won the championship James Valls was the strategist then and then throughout Mercedes long period of domination uh James was a strategist but Last year, his role had developed again to become almost like a senior member of the management, uh, basically you know, a little bit like Toto Wolff's understudy. And when Toto wasn't at the race in uh, Brazil, uh, James took over a lot of the responsibilities that that went that way. So it was clear that James's career was moving in this direction. Um, and then the Williams opportunity. And, you know, it's a tough one because it's a team that's, really at the back of the grid last year they were they had the slowest car uh you know they looked at times like a pretty poorly organized team so um i feel like they need someone to come in at the top but with with james i think they made the right move um and they've got someone in there who will look at things logically um and uh and look at the problems you know so often we heard mercedes talk about this culture of not blaming the people but the problem so you find out what the problem is okay someone might have caused it but you look at the reasons that person caused it and often it's a system that they were following and so you change that system so i think james has this really analytical way of looking at uh everything from race strategy to the engineering process um you know he was involved in that at mercedes as well and finding better ways to develop it and of course he's coming from mercedes with a huge deep knowledge of how that team has won eight championships in you know the last nine years so i think i think it's great um and uh yeah also james is a is a very nice nice person and also incredibly passionate he held a press conference uh, just after it was announced and he said since uh since he got the job um although he's not actually in it yet but since he had it confirmed uh he's been waking up at 6 a.m and writing notes um <laughs> about how to improve the williams team so this is a guy who is 
a hundred percent dedicated and motivated to do it and in a part of his career where he has to make it work for himself as well because if it goes wrong you know that that's going to be a real a real downer on his career so um yeah i think it's it's the right move Lawrence, I think most people would, would know him for Valtteri, it's James. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and now they're going to get to know him better. Nate, I, I want to ask you on with Williams. This is a team, nine constructors championships, second most in Formula One history behind Ferrari. Their last, though, in 1997. You look across the last five years, 10th place, 10th place, 10th place, 8th place, and 10th place. So this is a team that has obviously a, a, a very deeply rooted history in Formula One. Can can Vals come in and, and change that? Culture is what we've heard thrown around so much that, that Williams needs culture. Doralton Capital, obviously, we know has come in and give some financial stability. But this is a team that has been back at the grid for the last five years. Seems like some pretty heavy lifting is going to need to be done. Yeah, and it's difficult to hear that, that you know, that run of 10 just given the team, yeah, that I, I hate is. to pile on, but that's, yeah, no, I mean, but it's, I mean, it's, you, you're just, you're just spitting facts, but it, you, you, you know, when you hear it like that, it's crazy because, you know, growing up in the nineties, Williams was, was a powerhouse. It was one of those teams that, you know, if you beat, if, if Williams didn't win a race, you thought, okay, wow, someone must have really pulled out the stops to beat them. Um, <clears throat> Williams seemed to lose their way a little bit, you know, at the start of the V6 turbo era, they were actually kind of right up there as one of the best of the rest teams. And then things just kind of it just seemed to get away from them somehow. And I think it was one of those classic cases where, you know, things started to spiral downhill a little bit. You know, one thing led to another thing. You know, obviously they had the sale of the team. Claire Williams is no longer there. And, you know, the Williams family no longer attached to it in the way they were. Um, and I think it does seem like Oscar Peter is probably the, the wrong man for the job. You know, he's he's clearly very talented, but I don't know whether he was the right fit in that culture. You know, it seemed that there was a bit of a clash there with him. He brought in a lot of people from outside of Formula One in. Nothing wrong with that, but I think that given the situation Williams was in as well, it probably was this kind of perfect storm of of, of bad things going on there. So I think Lawrence hit the nail on the head. You know, Vows is the kind of guy, the kind of mind that you need for that small team. And actually, I think that he's going into a perfect situation for him because the pressure is going to be off. Obviously, everyone wants Williams to to move up the order, but I think that there's an expectation that it might take a bit of time. Um, and for the team itself, you know, I think going with a young guy as well, it's pretty exciting. It's always, it's you know, you can always go for an established guy who's maybe been to three, four, five teams before. But I always find them a bit uninspiring because you think, well, that person might be a have a track record, but they've also got a track record of leaving teams as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, look, we're I don't think we're going to be talking about Williams reigniting the glory days anytime soon you know, that's certainly you know it's something that's if it ever does happen it's it's a long long way away but i think williams just returning back to being a, a competitive midfield team at the very least that's what a team like that needs to be doing um and yeah you know it, it's going to take some time but you you look at a few you know i mean alfa romeo have leapt up the order you know you just need to you know get the right things into place, maybe get the drivers in place and you can do it. So it's, it's a start. And I'm, I'm glad that they've made that call. I was the same as Lawrence. I didn't expect Vals to be announced, but I was kind of worried. I thought, well, maybe this team's going to go into the new season without a team boss. And that obviously is a nightmare to do. They've obviously, they've still got to um, name a technical director, um, but they've filled the most important role in the team there. So it's a good start. And um, yeah, I think Vals' knowledge of Mercedes is going to be huge because if there's any blueprint for a team to follow, at the moment in Formula One, there's one of two. It's Mercedes and Red Bull, you know, and that's that's why Red Bull's staff are being poached by a lot of teams. It's why Mercedes staff are being poached by teams. Those are the those are the guys you want working for your teams. So yeah, great move. Yeah, so he's he's coming in a, a month and a half before the season starts. So you would think that most of the work for the car in, in 2023 has already been in place. So are are we talking back half of the year, maybe later portion of the year, where we can start to see some of the influence that that he has on the team and changing some of those processes to to influence the results? I think maybe some of the low hanging fruit can be sorted out by the end of the year, but realistically to see any significant change in performance and the way the teams run I think you've kind of got to give them a year to get everything sorted and like Nate said at the moment there's no technical director there so it's a very important role that needs to be filled and one that is you know will have a direct influence on the performance of the car in future years so there's um, bits and pieces to be done they've got some technical tie-ins with Mercedes as well uh, which um, I think, you know, with a bit of stability there, they, they might be able to find a route forward as well. So um, 
it, it will take time, you know, and this is the thing. We've got so many team principals changing teams at the moment. Fred Vasseur going to Ferrari is a, is a very obvious one. And again, I think they just need to be given given the time to, to get things sorted, to get their processes in place uh, to, I mean, you've got to go in there and understand what's wrong before you make changes as well. So um, it's going to take, you know, a few races at least to fully understand where the issues are, you know, on an operational level, and then even longer to understand maybe where the issues are in a development on a development level what are the shortcomings why can't they bring as many updates to the track um is it just financial is it in the manufacturing uh is the wind tunnel that they're using matching up to what's going on on track if and if not what kind of process do you put in place to uh to resolve that so there are so many factors in an f1 team and unfortunately it's not like soccer or other sports where sometimes you get a bit of a initial rally because there's just the enthusiasm of a new person leading the way, uh, that's not going to make a difference to how much downforce the car has. You know, <laughs> the car <laughs> is not responsive to, uh, to to who the team principal is. So there's a lot of stuff um, that will take time to change. But I think this seems like a decision that's been made for all the right reasons and therefore James will be given uh, the time to, to, to make changes he needs. I think the only thing that might be the limiting factor is whether uh, Toto, who has talked about maybe stepping back over time at Mercedes, eventually makes that decision in three, four years' time. Could that be the moment when James goes back to Mercedes and, and takes over Toto's role there? Because it seemed like he was kind of being trained into that position anyway. So... Um, that will be an interesting one to keep an eye on. But Toto said that he's still pretty enthusiastic and he's not planning to go anywhere just yet. So that's that's where my mind went. And I don't think I've heard it attacked from the angle of how bad does this hurt Mercedes? You talked about the success that they started to have towards the end of the year. Brazil finally getting that that breakthrough. Toto not being there. So how big of a loss to Mercedes is this? It's significant because he is a big role in the team. Like I said before, he, he went from making the top strategy calls to delegating that to someone else and kind of then overseeing th things in general. But he was also part of their young driver uh, uh, program. You know, he was uh, a huge influence within the engineering room. So it is a big loss. But the one thing that um, Mercedes has done well over the years is, uh, is to have enough depth within the team that yes, when a single person leaves, it's, it's, it's a bit of a hit, but everybody else within the team is so integrated with that person has learned so much from that person that they know if they have a weakness, they know what it is and they know how to attack it. And so, I mean, the one uh, person that springs to mind who, who left that team and it, you know, it was a big deal was Aldo Costa, who was, you know, uh, one of the top designers there. Um, and when he, um, you know, stood back and, and, and left and he went to work for Delara um, you know, there were there were a few questions, but Mercedes just kind of continued. And then James Allison's another one. You know, he was technical director, but decided that he wanted basically a bit more of his life back and a bit of time to focus on other projects. And so he's he's still up the team, but he's um he's in a position which is slightly removed from the you know direct influence on on the on the car and and where resources are put and everything. And uh and they've you know they've survived that as well to some extent. Of course, last year wasn't great, so maybe there is an impact there. But um, but I, I feel like there's enough in place and there's enough people there that that they will be able to carry on. But of course, you know, any team that loses someone like that is a big deal. If you look at Red Bull, for example, with Dan Fallows, who went to um Aston Martin, that was a big hit for them. Um, but they they, they found ways around it. And, you know, they tried very, very hard to keep him. And uh, and and they couldn't. So um, the money was just too big coming from Aston Martin. So it's the nature of F1, and 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 it's good for the sport as well. You don't want necessarily a situation where all the best engineers are tied into long contracts they can't get out. Um, because if you know if you look at the Mercedes team and the engineers they have there, well, actually they'd all been working together for such a long time they'd become so cohesive that um, that they were almost unbeatable for a period of time. Uh, you know, <laughs> they were unbeatable <laughs> in twenty twenty one. Yeah. Um, and uh, it takes a lot to, to to overcome that. So it'll be a hit, but yeah, I I, th I think they'll they'll have people in place and uh, and processes in place to deal with it.
Yeah, as a team, 114 wins across their history since 1978. Their last, though, the Spanish GP of 2012, Pastor Maldonado. Pastor that, Maldonado. I mean, that's crazy, see, isn't it? So that, that was a crazy start to that season, too. And, and you think about mm. what was it the first eight races in 2012 that all saw different winners. And mm. and you you go back to a season like that, and we've talked parity, uh, you know, trying to to see more competitiveness. But when I was looking through and thinking about that season, when when he won and what a crazy start it was, and you talk fan engagement, I, I think the sport wants to move towards having every team an ability to win each race, and not oh, you go in, Mercedes is going to win this one, Red Bull is going to win this one, Ferraris going to to win this one so now hopefully with this talent being spread across we see more of an environment with that 2012 that's a long time for williams yeah, so yeah. I, I was at that race um and it was also the race where afterwards the garage burnt down they had a gar- they had a fire in the garage and so uh the winning car was engulfed in in flames um and it was a bizarre moment in the paddock um to see smoke billowing from one end uh, remember i was in a Ferrari press conference with Stefano Domenicali, who was the team principal at the time. And uh, he stopped and he just kind of looked out the window and he said, uh, wait a minute, I think there's something more important <laughs> going on than what I'm saying. And so we all ran out there and um, yeah, cha- chaotic scenes. We will see a revised qualification format for up to two races. So we can, we can pump the brakes a little bit. Uh, this will be... The same in the sense of 2015-10, last year finally got rid of what I thought was one of the dumbest rules in Formula One of having to start the race on the tire compound that you ended in Q2. But for these two events that they do and to evaluate, quote, for suitable subsequent events, Q1 will be on hards, Q2 will be on mediums, and Q3 will be on softs, the tire compound. If it is determined to be wet, they can go out on any compound. So for up to two events that we see, what do you guys think about this revised quality format? Well, what I like about the most is that it's already got an acronym. So if you look on the F1 website, the revised qualifying format in brackets, RQF, F1 <laughs> just loves an acronym, DRS, you know, curves, everything. So yeah, it's got one of those. So, you know, you, you know, it's legit. It's, it's definitely an F1 thing. Um, I, I, you know, I, I like a bit of experimentation and this is very mild experimentation. You know, I, I think most kind of casual fans may not have even noticed if, you know, if it wasn't pointed out. Um, so uh, it, it's an interesting one as well, because uh, some circuits you'll have one tire, which teams just do not want to use because it's not working. Like the chemical compound is not getting switched on if it's too hard or if it's too soft, it's just falling apart. So this way, it makes them use all of those compounds and uh, in qualifying, and then obviously they'll they'll save what they need for the race as well. Um, the other factor in this, which I think is one of the reasons it's being trialed, is that it allows them to reduce the amount of dry sets of tyres per car from 13 sets to 11 sets. Now, not a huge amount, but if you did, if you're able to do that across the whole course of a season, uh, you would obviously save quite a lot of tires. The tires have to be transported, like we we're talking about earlier, and everything else. So um, I think that's part of the reason they're looking at it. They've been talking for a while about how can they reduce the amount of tires used over a race weekend just for sustainability purposes. So it's it's interesting. I, a bit of experimentation, fine, go for it. Um, w- will it make the will it make it any better? I don't know, because I think in Q1, you're still going to have the same team scrapping over, not making it through. You know, you may have a situation where, let's say, for argument's sake, the Mercedes is way better on the hard tire and the Red Bull's way better on the soft tire. So the Mercedes is faster than Q1. But that doesn't make any difference when it comes to setting the grid, because we'll get to Q3 and the soft tires will be on and uh, and it will go to the advantage of whoever's got the soft tire. So, yeah, it's um, it'll be nice to experiment with, but I think it's nothing more than that. Hard tires seemed uh, somewhat useless last year. Not a lot of teams wanted to operate. Nate, I, I think you you think back to to last year, Brazil specifically. I think when when we get qualification, you always see it when there's wet conditions that that you can really see the jumble it, within the order. Is this going to introduce maybe a little bit more of that to where we can see drivers like K Mag be be a top after qualification, or will it be more in line with fastest car, fastest driver? I think it's hard to say. I mean, it, I think the, the one thing that F1 always needs is a bit of jeopardy and a bit of the unknown. 
you know, to to spice up, especially a qualifying session. So it, it it adds that in. You know, we had that really frustrating thing from from the previous format. Although you know, as it was, was 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 still pretty great. But you'd have the the quickest teams kind of going through Q two on say the medium tire, and everyone else kind of going through on on the soft tire, just showing how quick they were. Then they started on different tires, etc. Like you said, it's it's taken that aspect out of it. I always thought that was a bit of a shame because it was just like, well, look how fast these cars up at the front are. They don't even need to use the same compound as the other guys. Um, we'll see. I mean, I think that that's why Formula One's testing it out, you know, to see is it going to massively change things? Is it actually going to be the you know part of the course? Is it going to be exactly the same as it is now? Um, and again, this goes back to the point about so many races. When you have that many races, I think it's healthy to to try different things out and say, okay, well, at this race we're going to do this. At this race we're going to do that. I think that's why the sprint race has you know has worked. You know, at, at some of the events it's been at, it's because a, it's a bit different. You go into it, and you're like, oh, it's a sprint weekend this weekend. So it might be that teams say, well, this actually works really well at these types of circuits, or you know, we really like this for you know for some of the circuits where maybe we want a mixed up grid or something like that. So yeah, I'm I'm all for it. I wanted to save plenty of time for this one. I'll, I'll credit David, our producer, for the question. But if you could implement one change, what would it be? And I'm sure this could be a seven-hour podcast where we could keep going. But I think the three of us, one change, what would you like to see? Lawrence, you start us. Yeah, I, I do have a list. But the one – and there's doable changes and there's harder changes, right? So th this – I have one hard change, and that's the weight of the cars, which at the moment is – is, is too high and it impacts on a lot of things it makes the cars look lazy when they're on track on heavy fuel as well you know they don't look quite as exciting to watch as as the cars which were about 200 kilos lighter in the mid 2000s so uh if you talk to a lot of the drivers it's the one thing that always comes up these cars are now too heavy for what is a traditional formula one car and um I think it's something that the sport is going to try and address in the, the next regulation set. They've said they're going to try and bring it down, but you've got a number of factors going on. Uh, one is these hybrid systems that are fitted to the cars, are pretty heavy bits of kit. And the other is safety. A lot of the weight, uh, increased weight is due to safety. So it's a difficult one, but I, I would like to see if there was a way to, to reduce the weight of the cars, because I think um, while you won't see it by looking at the car from the outside and all the rest of it, I think when you see some of the onboard footage from uh, previous decades, one of the reasons the cars look so lively and exciting and also the offboard footage is because they were that bit lighter. So, um, yeah, there you go. I'm, I'm sure Nate's got something left field, brilliant. I do, yeah. Have great ideas. I've got the boring one, but there you go. Before, before Nate, you said uh, how many kilos? Uh, well, how much do they used to be? No, how many kilos overweight you would like to see them trim? Oh, I'd love to see them go back to the 600 kilo cars they had in the mid 2000s. So that would be about 200 kilos off the current ones. 200 kilos. So I just have to make sure for our Americans that, that don't oh. take a kilo. That's 440 pounds. So you know, yeah. we're talking substantial weight. <laughs> Yeah, a for a second, story. for a second, I thought Tyler was asking me how many kilos I need to lose, and I thought, wow, <laughs> <laughs> it really it caught me out for a second there, dude. I was no, like, wait, no. wait a sec, <laughs> Nate, your your change, your one change. What would you like to say? So see? that shows you how well Lawrence knows me. Mine is absolutely left field, and I think I've pitched it to him before. And you know, I'm semi serious about this. Obviously, it's it's a bit ridiculous, but one thing I'd I'd always love to see is a rule where you qualify for the next race. So what you do, so let's say in Bahrain, you have qualifying as normal, but that qualifying session sets the grid for the second race of the season. You know, and then when you get, you know, obviously you'd need to, you'd need a first event to do that with, obviously for the first one. But I've always thought that'd be quite interesting because you'd have cars kind of qualifying out of position for the, the circuit they're then going to. You'd have situations, you know, where in your, your car might be perfectly set up for Monaco, but because you didn't qualify on pole the race before Monaco, you're kind of having to battle through the field. I think that that would add, again, it adds that kind of jeopardy situation. Um, and, you know, if you think about it to the end of the season, the team that qualifies quickest at the final race of the year is then on pole for the first race of the next season. Now, that might spoil the first race a little bit in terms of that excitement from from qualifying. So I totally see that there's some there's some some issues there. Um, I think you could have testing. Why not have the result? Could make testing more... So on the last yeah, day there you go. Uh, a quality session in testing, it. absolutely. Um, Add that some would be interest great. there, and then that solves your first race problem, and then off you go. Yeah, that's yeah. The final qualifying of the session, uh, sorry, of the season. I don't know. Maybe you could have points 
allocated to that because obviously there maybe good points. I thought maybe it could roll over to the following season, you know, the yeah, first race. Point. But yeah, but but I like your idea as well. But I think that I think any change you bring in, you have to you have to tread that fine line between adding some jeopardy in there, but also not kind of making it too gimmicky, you know, and, and having something where it's like, well, this is just a bit stupid. You know, Bernie Eccleston's famous one for that was double points at the final race. Everyone hated it because it was just like, there's better ways to make this finale better. You know, it doesn't need to be points, uh, imp- you know, increasing like that. So, you know, obviously people probably listen to this. I'm not 100%, you know, that I don't think that would ever come in. But I think that the key to a lot of Formula 1s, I don't want to say problems because I think racing has been really, really good over the past few seasons, but we see more and more that the really great races are when the grids are, ma- are mixed up. You know, I think racing itself has actually been pretty good recently. Wheel to wheel racing, you know, DRS is, is still important, but it's not the deciding factor now if, if, if cars are overtaking each other. And I think that the Saturday or, or the Friday on a sprint weekend really sets the tone for the rest of the weekend. So if you can find a way to, to have mixed up grids a lot more without taking away the, how special it is to be on pole position, you know, that's the key there. You don't want to, you don't want to dilute, using that word again, Tyler, dilute um, <laughs> qualifying from what it from, from what it should be, then I think you're onto something good there. But, you know, it's hard to find something that that does that because it's such a fine line to tread. But that would be mine. It would be something around the, you know, how we set the grid because, or or you just, you come up with a, you know, you, you, you put every race into one of three pots. You say, right, this is, this is going to be a qualifying event where you're, you're qualifying for Sunday. But on Saturday, there's a reverse grid based on the championship. And that's end of, you know, you no arguments about it. You're still qualifying for the Grand Prix. Pole position still starts on pole. But you have a sprint race with the same, you know, the same points available for um, as there is now. But, you know, it'd be, I mean, that would be carnage. And some circuits, I think that'd be really, really quite special at. Some circuits, it might not be <laughs> very good at all. Like, if, again, if you did that in Monaco, it might just be an absolute, like, it might be an absolute disaster. You know, you'd have the slowest cars out in front, very little room to overtake. Um, but yeah, so long winded way of saying I did have a left field one. And the key is always in qualifying. Yeah, I, I thought of when you said uh, double points at the last race. I'm not sure how familiar you guys are. MTV used to have something called Rock and Jock. It was a celebrity uh, basketball game that they would play back in the 90s. And in the last two minutes of the game, like 20 to 30 feet in the air, they would put a 30 point basket. So if a team was down 30 points and you made a 30 That's pointer, cool. you'd be right back in it. But yeah. That's like. It's yeah. like next next goal wins. You know, if you play five aside football yeah. in the UK, you, you, your team usually you, you're looking at the watch, you think, and there's only five minutes left in this game, two minutes left in the game. Your team's six goals down, and someone optimistically shouts, "Next goal wins!" Right, and your team inevitably in that situation, if you're down, somehow manages to score that goal, and then you say, "Oh, we won the game," and you obviously you didn't. So, yeah. yeah. I think it's it's just that fine line of something that's not too gimmicky that still promotes competitive balance. For me, uh, I would like to see no tire obligations. And and I, you talk Alex Albon, you go back to that race in Australia where he ran ninety eight percent of the race, and you talk about drivers that are tire whisperers, Checo Perez, the way that that he can can do with his tires. Mercedes, the the car last year, and how it treated its tires differently in races compared to qualification. That I think if you took away that that restriction and having to come in and change the compound that you add in that whole new element the driver element different drivers different cars different days in conditions we've seen that it brings in that that element of having to think on the fly and then you have so many variables that can influence if you started the race and you said you know what i'm good i can take these tires all the way to the end of the race and and in that race you look at albon who was and williams who were dead last and he's able to finish in the points so i think that that could be something that's very easy low-hanging fruit where yes we love to see the the drama the pit stop and it brings it in you know when the car's in but if you have a driver in a car or, or if they're talented enough good enough with those tires to, to take it through let them do it red bull they are coming stateside new york city february 3rd they will launch their car this is pretty big in the sense that first formula one team to come to the united states go to the big apple and they're going to unveil their car for the coming season what do you guys think of this news i think it's awesome i love this um you know i'm a big fan of all things america and um i think it really speaks to where f1 is in in the country right now you know the red bull are kind of they're filling their car up with american sponsors you know they've they've obviously they've got oracle at the title sponsor there if you look on the sponsors they've brought in over the past two years, so many American names there. Um, and season launch, you know, it's, it, I think 
more and more it's important to to realize that the further away a launch is from testing, the less likely it is you're seeing anything close to the car that's going to roll out of the garage on that first day of testing. Um, you know, Red Bull especially like to leave that as late as possible. You know, they're they're designing the car right up until it has to basically start being shipped up and and you know testing's not in Spain this year like it was in previous years in Bahrain. But it will be from what we understand, it's a livery launch. You know, there's some other things they're announcing there as well. Um, and I think that it's just it would be a great example of how far things have come because I don't think a team would have bothered doing this five years ago, even if they had an American title sponsor. I just think they would have thought, well, the, you know, the media uptake for this is probably going to be pretty low. Um, ESPN, you know, we've been in planning meetings today, but there's quite a lot going on. You know, we're, we're really excited about some of the stuff that there is to do there. Um, and yeah, I, I, again, it, it just wouldn't have happened a few years back. So really great. And um, obviously... Red Bull are the guys to beat right now as well. So if there's any team that should be launching their car and their season in the Big Apple, New York seems sorry. Red Bull and New York seems pretty appropriate. We can tell you're you're an American sports fan. You have the is that a New England Tom Brady or a no, Tom no, Tom? absolutely not. It's a Buccaneers Buccaneers ah, shirt. Well, Come yeah, on, your uh, man Tom last night. My Cowboys. I'm not. No, they they go on the road and got a got a. Dump. Oh, you Cowboys. Oh man, uh, I, when you said Austin, you you lived in Austin, Texas, I was like, well, maybe he's not a Cowboys fan. But um, yeah. no, we're not uh, talking about it. You know, as, as far as I'm concerned, Brady he retired last year mentally. I think physically he didn't, but mentally I'm 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 saying he checked out last year. I was trying to think of of how I could liken it to you guys to understand the Cowboys haven't won a road playoff game in nearly thirty years. Uh, I had so never I beaten trying, Brady either. Yeah, but... they hadn't beaten Brady, so I was trying to look through what would be comparable in Formula One, and the best that I could come up with was Ferrari winning at Monaco. And I know Ferrari has won at Monaco within the last ten years, but you go back the last thirty years for Ferrari to win at Monaco, but pretty pretty big deal, and for suffering Cowboys. Boys fans, uh, for us to actually win in the playoffs, beat Tom Brady, and and win on the road. Now they got to deal with the Niners, but <laughs> so th- there's our NFL talk. I-, I had to get that in there. I think we get we, we squeeze some in every every pod now, which I which I'm liking. So good to keep the trend going. Lawrence, what, what do you think of Red Bull coming over uh, to New York City? Oh, I'm grateful because I thought you were going to ask me about the NFL, of which I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> what was great uh, on that? <laughs> I, I, I'm learning. I'm learning. Nate, Nate kind of coaches me free games and stuff like that. He kind of tells me what's going on and what a penalty is when it's a penalty. Oh, it, it's a horrible sport to try to to, to learn. I, I make a lot of that stuff up, Lawrence, as we go, to be honest. I'm like, yeah, I think <laughs> I, I think it's a penalty for this well, reason. Well, you sound authoritative, but yeah, yeah. maybe, maybe <laughs> yeah. Moving on. Uh, what do I think about Red Bull and you? I, I think it's really cool. It's um, It's if you think of all the locations in the world where you could have an event and all this is, is hype, right? I mean, like Nate said, you're not going to see the RB19 in New York. Forget it. You'll see a show car with a lovely new livery and, you know, new sponsors or whatever. Um, So uh, if you're going to do that kind of thing, where better to do it than New York? You know, it really has it all. And um, if you look at the calendar as well, the F1 calendar that we were talking about earlier, three races in the United States. Um, When I first started working in this job, um, there were no races in the United States, uh, and uh, my career <laughs> it doesn't feel like it's been that long. Um, so that is, you know, it's a remarkable step that the US is now considered the place to activate, the place to look for sponsors, to look for money, maybe looking for drivers. You know, we've got Logan Sargent coming on. Uh, I think every team would love to have an American driver if they could find one that they felt uh, fitted the bill. So it's... Um, it's great, and uh, I, I think it's um, it's going to be something pretty special. And it's also nice because it's at the start of February. Most of the other teams are launching mid February, so um, yeah. If you're getting a bit tired of not having any uh, events, any F1 kind of action going on, well, at least uh, Red Bull are kicking us off a bit earlier than than we would have been otherwise. I would think too the visuals of being in New York City. You you watch the launches last year, and and it's pretty stale to be on a, a big sound stage, and you just have the the drop back behind you. But you know we saw that when Formula One was down in Vegas this past year when they were previewing it, and you saw Lewis Hamilton down there, you saw Checo down there, you saw the cars going up and down, and and getting that visual of what it may look like. And I'm I'm not saying a New York City race, but just seeing that visual of a Formula One car in New York City will be pretty cool. Well, I think yeah, Rebel, Rebel did some promotional stuff. Was it last year or last yeah, couple of yeah. years? Last Where year. Checo drove from New York City yeah. to, to Miami. I believe. Well, I, uh, you know how, how cool is that? You just see a, a an F1 car on the road in. New York, the sound bouncing off the uh, buildings. I mean, that's an old V8 as well in that car. So it's 
really loud as a screamer. So um, anyone who's fairly new to the sport, when they went around when the V8s were in Formula One, uh, so that's pre-2013, go and check out all of Red Bull's posts over the last few weeks because it's been about uh, New York and and those V8 cars going around. So, um, yeah, that, that's very cool. So I'm, I'm sure Red Bull will bring something along and, and make it a, a really cool event. They always do. It's kind of it's kind of what Red Bull as a company, wider than F1, does best. It's just they just do cool things. They have you know cool people take them to cool places, make cool things happen. Final segment. Have you seen this? And this is your opportunity if you want to own a Formula One car, kind of. That you can go out. Ferrari, the F175 that raced last year. Amalgam, who does a great job in putting together these replica models. You can get a one-fifth scale model of the F175, but the price tag is kind of hefty. Yeah, we might have to dig into that. Last week we were talking about putting a GoFundMe together for uh, a Vegas ticket for a few years' time. We might have to double double the the, the reason for having that. Uh to to afford this i mean it looks it looks pretty great so i think if i had the money i'm just looking here thirty thirty thousand dollars i think it is 30 grand um, if i had thirty thousand dollars lying around this might be on my list of things to buy um very very cool and i love all those you know scaled down models of cars and helmets and stuff like that i think we've all got something similar in our backgrounds uh lawrence and i certainly do so yeah i definitely would uh, i know i mean lawrence absolutely would as well in fact i'm not so sure Lawrence isn't already saving for one of these, you know, just, just putting some of the pennies away. Um, but I could totally see this in, in the background of Lawrence's house. I'm, I'm you, I mean, you see my McLaren right here, my Lego Technic McLaren that I, I built myself. Lawrence, you said you have the, the same model, correct? I have that same model. I haven't found a way to mount it on a wall, but having seen that it's inspiration. So I used to have it on one of my shelves back here and it was just too big. And I think this is the only problem about this other car is I don't have a, this Ferrari, this amazing F-175 one-fifth model is that I don't have anywhere in my house. I, don't, I live in a small flat in London. I don't have anywhere I can put it, but I'm sure I'd find a way, you know, if, if anyone's feeling generous. It's easy. I'll show you the hack with with the Lego. There's a, where the, the running plank would be. Within yeah. there, I just took a piece of wood, drilled it into my wall, and it sits on it perfectly. It, it always amazes me. You go in, uh, I know they have it in museums, but you go into to the factories uh, where they have the actual Formula One car on the wall. And it's like, how do you how do you get it up there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Red Bull have one of those outside their cafeteria. And um it's it's hanging, it's upside down on 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 the roof. And uh I think they said to David Coulthard, they because there's always this thing about a Formula One car, because it creates so much downforce, creates more downforce than the amount that it weighs, therefore it could go upside down in a tunnel. And they always said to David Coulthard when he's at the team, like, that's gonna be you, mate. We're gonna put you up upside down, we're gonna get <laughs> you driving uh, around. But uh, they never quite did it. But again, if anyone's gonna drive a car upside down in a tunnel, which apparently is possible the only problem is the engine might be starved of oil and go bang um then red bull's probably the team to do it as well that's like hot wheels you know yeah exactly I, i've seen uh, red bull's done it with i believe one of their rally cars right I, i've seen you know where they did you know a big loop to loop like that that would take uh quite the driver though to be brave enough to to go inverted yeah that's right um yeah I, I, that's the thing there's a number of problems Probably the biggest one being finding the man who's going to go and oh, do it. But. I think they know that. I think Max would do that in a heartbeat. Give him, <laughs> let, let him win a few more championships. That's right. I know the insurance company is going to let Max. Well, that's yeah. that. That then becomes the issue. But yeah, I think Max himself would be would be game to do that. No doubt. Yeah, I appreciate you guys letting me uh, deputize. Katie will be back next week, and and I felt uh, I was trying to do my best. Nico Hulkenberg. He came in, filled in for Sebastian Vettel, obviously last year, but then he did find himself a permanent drive on the grid. So. I hope to be back uh, with you all, maybe in a more permanent fixture as we move forward. We did a better job than Nico because when he <laughs> when he and I first spoke, we didn't really get on very well. But we've gone on fine, Tyler. So you know, don't put yourself down. I don't think it was. Uh, yeah. I'm fine with fine with Hulkenberg now, but yeah, there was some beef there to begin with. So you've yeah. done better than that. outside of the results <laughs> factor, which you know, credit. You know, I, I look forward to seeing <laughs> yeah. what he can do with a little more of an off season, uh, you know, under his belt. <laughs> so. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you like, subscribe, wherever you grab your podcast. Leave us some comments on YouTube as well. Give us five stars. Be back every Wednesday, Unlapped, here on ESPN. Katie will be back for Nate Lawrence. Everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. <laughs>